man, Alabama got old. <laughs> Gosh, I'm not sure hospice wasn't running the sound system last night. <laughs> uh, wow, it was great seeing them. Gosh, it brought back old memories. Uh, on the way back home, Heather and I, I played, I played the greatest hits on the way home. And, um, you know, just, uh, just flirting. <laughs> just, just redneck flirting, you know. Hey, speaking of Heather, I'd like to invite her up on stage. Would you come up here? Ladies and gentlemen, today is Heather Bean's birthday, and we want to celebrate her. Yes, you're amazing. You did great, okay? Listen, we want to sing happy birthday to you. Come over here. Okay, so in the first service, we gave her a cake. But in this service, you get a glass of milk, okay? There was actually a jug, and, and we brought you a jug. There you go. Look at this guy. That's, that's service right there. All right. So if you would, would you join me in happy birthday to Heather? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Heather. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> you need a microphone? Why? Happy birthday. Hey, this is like I like this. This is like everybody's worst nightmare is being <laughs> sung to by the Lord. I don't know. That looked pretty dreamy to me. <laughs> <laughs> Happy birthday. Thank you all very much. Yes. What? Yeah, go. You listen to the first service, just go in the back and enjoy your cake. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. So glad you're here. Um, first of all, I just want to stop and just say we live in an amazing community. We live in an amazing community. To all the people that work their tail off for the Lee County Fair and Pro Rodeo, you guys need to be just celebrated. That is a lot of hard work for a community that just sometimes takes it for granted. And you can go, let me tell you, from a rodeo perspective, I've been to a lot of rodeos in my life. The Lee County Pro Rodeo and the fair is one of the most first class places you can go. And the things that our county commissioners do for us, the, the fair board, the rodeo committee, heck, go down the list. They spend shine the spotlight on so many people in our community, the kids, the, the contestants, the, the fiddlers, the, the who made the best jam, who grew the biggest beans. I mean, it's an amazing thing. There are communities in our um, nation that wish they had what we just experienced for a week, and they may be here, they not, may not be here. But I think we should stop and just say thank you to everybody who worked so hard for the Lee County Fair and Pro Rodeo. Yes. We want to welcome everybody on our online campus. So glad you're joining us today. For all the young men at the Juvenile Detention Center, welcome, welcome, welcome. So glad you're a part of the service today. Can you help me welcome all the young men at the Juvenile Detention Center? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Jesus, we love you. Father, we celebrate you. You're amazing. We love you. We thank you for who you are. You're great. You're greatly to be praised. Jesus, today, more than any other day, maybe it's because it's today, I pray, Holy Spirit, come start a work in our hearts right now. Everybody breathe in. <sighs> breathe out. Holy Spirit, you are the air that we breathe. You are the life that we long for. And now, in whatever stories are in this room, whatever is happening in their lives right now, we didn't come to focus on those things. We came to have our heart touched by you. Holy Spirit, in each one of our lives right now, how it means personally, I pray the words that come out of my mouth in the next few minutes would go directly to the story that we're living right now. We love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to tell you a story to kick off today, tell you a story that is a little embarrassing for me. I'm not proud of this story. 
I have cringed of this moment in my life for a very long time. And I have seen God not remove this story from my life, but I have seen God keep this story in my life, and it has been such a teaching moment in my life. I was 16 or 17 years old, and I loved dragging Maine. That's what we did in Artesia, right, Corey? We drug Maine. Corey knows. I think he still has the white and red truck that he drove Maine in back, back in our, the Artesia days. And that's what we would do in Artesia on a Friday and a Saturday night. We would drag Maine. We'd cruise around Sonic. And we'd go down to Circle to K and turn around. And, and it was fun. You'd see all your friends. Um, I had a CB handle. Everybody had CBs, okay? And if you wonder what that was, it was texting before texting came out. <laughs> We had CBs. Um, my CB handle was Garbanzo. And um, yeah, you'll get that going home today. And, 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 and we would talk and we'd laugh and, and, and we would pull over. We'd pull over and we'd just meet all our friends in different parking lots and we'd just talk and laugh and have fun. We'd do all kinds of neat stuff. And there was this one particular night that there was this, this group of guys and we we're all just, all just cruising Maine. And now we're parked and we're just watching people honking driving by, and there was four people walking up to us, and instantly I knew what they were doing. They were witnessing. They were witnessing. They were sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were, they were praying for people who ever needed prayer, and they just chose Main Street because it's, it's the place where the actions happen in Artesia on a Friday or Saturday night, and, and I instantly had an unusual thing happen in my heart. Now, at the time, I just want to let you know, I was a Christian. I, 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 at, at that age, I, I was in love with Jesus. I knew Jesus. I wanted to follow Jesus. If you were to say, Ty, if you were to die right now, where would you go? I would say, by the blood of Jesus, I'm going to heaven. But I was still trying to get my spiritual feet underneath me. Did I know that at the time? No. And so here it comes along four people that I agree with what they're doing. Heck, somebody did that in my life at one time. But as they get closer, this rage began to come up inside of me. Not in the, in the form of, of like I'm going to punch them or I, 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 I hate them. I just, I felt my heart just put up this wall that by the time they got to me, I was cold. Now you know cold. Cold never feels as bad for the person who is cold as it is the person who's experiencing the cold. If, 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 you, if I'm cold to you and you were to come to me and say, Ty, I just felt like you're just, you're just cold. What's, what did I do? I, I might do something defensive like you would do something defensive and say something like, there's nothing wrong with me. What's wrong with you? Why do you think something's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with me. What's wrong with you? Don't, you know exactly what I'm talking about because you do the very same thing. It's never as bad in our hearts as it is for the person receiving it. But I was cold. And they could recognize that I was cold. This was so unusual. This was a first encounter of something that I believe in, something that I, I, I'm so glad God did in my life. But now I am having these pushback feelings towards these people who are just easily, gracefully, kindly walking Main Street of Artesia, witnessing, passing out tracts, praying for people. And I am cold Towards them. I'm embarrassed to tell you that. I, 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 I truly cringe on the inside right now telling you this story. I tell you it because maybe we can relate on this. That's something you believe in, but you, you just wish it wasn't now. It wish, you wish it wasn't. How come tonight? What makes it even worse, and I'm especially embarrassed, but the four people were my pastor, his two sons, and my youth pastor. People who I loved very much. And at that moment, I could have chewed nails. I was so mad that they were doing this on my night. I thought a lot about why I was so mad that night. Um, one, this is, my, this is my turf. 
two, I'm kind of a big deal. I mean, I, 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 the, we're having fun. I'm, I'm the class clown. I'm the guy with the most school spirit. I, I, I'm, the, I'm, the one, I'm the one voted most likely to succeed. Well, maybe not that one. But I, I, was, I was the guy, I, I was the guy that, that was a class favorite. And, and, and the question is going to come, hey, Bean, isn't this your pastor? And it was just crawling up my stomach, through my heart. Have you had those feelings before? And you can feel your heart getting hard. God's never removed that story from my life. For years, God has brought me back to that because I turned into those gentlemen, those amazing gentlemen sharing Christ. And I've walked into the rodeo arena and I've watched and witnessed people just wondering what I was doing. Uh, this is our rodeo. This, this, is, this is my kid's rodeo. What are you doing here? And knowing that, oh, I know God called me here, but oh, God, I remember that night. The reason why I wanted to relate that story to you, and maybe you can feel it, is because in some form or fashion, every one of us Jesus followers are still experiencing our old heart. It never goes away, by the way. You may think, I'm a new creation in Christ, and you are, and I'm glad you use that scripture, but there are moments there are moments that your heart hardens. And today I'd like to talk to you about your heart. And today if you're in this room and you're not a Jesus follower, I hope that you see Christians being honest that God's still dealing with our hearts. If you're struggling in this room, if you're somebody that you, you, you really believe that you are a Jesus follower, but gosh, I, I, I get tripped up. I get pulled to the darkness. I get pulled to the gray area. I'm, I'm, I'm heavily influenced. I'm, 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 I'm somebody that, that at times can be completely trusted, and then there's times I don't trust myself. I would like to identify today two key things that I think are so crucial to becoming the people that God's called us to be. And since we've been talking for the last several weeks about your assignment. Can I speak to everybody still struggling with their assignment? There is going to be a heart that is going to be fighting the God assignment on your life. There is going to be a hardness of your heart towards the things that God is saying, I need you to move into your assignment in this area. That person is your assignment. That area is your assignment. That office is your assignment. That school is your assignment. And fear will grip you, and other things will grip you, and it will start with your heart. And if it can harden your heart, it can change your thoughts, and it'll come out your mouth. I promise. So today I want to kick off with a couple statements. And if you're taking notes, take notes. If you're taking pictures, take pictures. But these are the things I think we need to go back and look at. And all throughout this message, I'm going to be speaking directly to your heart. I need your heart to hear what God has to say. First thing I want to cover is this. People who are desperate to know God are desperate for his spirit. Now you may ask, well, what does this have to do with my heart? The spirit of God, Holy Spirit, is the only thing that can change our hearts. And today, I'm going to show you what the law does. And today, I, I'm a pro-word guy, and I love prayer, and I love church. But can I turn to you and tell you that we're going to find out today that the only thing, the only person who can change our hearts is the Spirit of the living God. Yeah. I don't know what you've been taught about the Holy Spirit, but can I turn to you and tell you that He is a, he is a part of the Trinity, he is as real as God is real. He is as real as Jesus is real. Of the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, not one can think a thought that the other one can't think. Not one can do something that the other one's not a part of. The Holy Spirit, I say that loosely, the Holy Spirit, and the reason I say it loosely is because Holy Spirit is his, is his name. And Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is what gives us a desperation for the things of God. 
I want you to envision right now your stomach. And you know what it's like for your stomach to crave food. You, you crave food. Does your heart crave Holy Spirit like your stomach craves food? And we feed our stomach, don't we? We feed it because we know how. But many times our heart is hard, but we don't know how to feed it. And today's the answer to that question. Holy Spirit is the only person who can change your heart. And people, people who are desperate to know God, people who want to know God's plans, people who know that my heart gets hard on the things that it shouldn't get hard over, recognize they have to be desperate for His Spirit. Number two, if, if we're not desperate for His Spirit, we are content with living without the presence of God. Now, I know there's a lot of mmm in the room, but I want you to really think about this because there are moments that we just kind of sometimes come to the conclusion that, well, maybe God will speak to them, but he won't speak to me. Maybe God has an assignment for them, but he doesn't for me. I am good with knowing that I'm going to die and go to heaven. I'm good to know that the Savior is my Savior. But as far as the presence of God, I'm content with living without it. And that is not something God wants for your life. In fact, I would bet that even now as we're talking about it, there is a longing. There is an emotional desire. God Please do something about my heart. Do something about my heart. My heart is the one thing that affects my marriage. My heart is the one thing that, that, that gives me a view of my kids. Right now I'm seeing my kids as, as, as a burden. Right now I'm seeing my kids as just a constant noise in my life. I'm seeing my job. I'm seeing my job as, as a complete waste of my day. And, and I go around in life wondering, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? Can I turn to tell you that, that, that you may be one of the ones that's just content living without the presence of God. And I want to be the person that gets you to lean in and say, you don't have to. You don't have to. You can find the joy of the Lord again. You can find that this presence of God is asking you to come along. You can find that there is love for people. You can find there's purpose for children. You can find the joy of living again because you're not content. You're not content living without the presence of God. And it starts with your heart. And your heart can only be changed by the spirit of the living God. Okay? This is real. This will change everything. This will change from looking from people as a burden to a blessing. This will change you from looking at a problem to having a peace. You, I'm telling you guys, it will change you from being looking at something as, as, as overwhelming to all of a sudden being your assignment. All because, are you ready? The Holy Spirit has changed your heart. But there's a question. And the question really is, do we really want the Spirit of God in our life? Because, I don't know if you know this, but I have recognized there's so many things that would tell of to take the place of the Spirit of God. And listen, there's a lot of good things out there that in your 24-hour day, we can find ourselves consumed with Netflix. You know, we're, we're calling Saul instead of calling Jesus. See, you bunch of sinners, you got that joke. You bunch of backslidden, your laugh gave it up, didn't it? All the saints are like, I don't get it. Exactly, keep praying. That's right, yeah. Do you really want the Spirit of God? It's, it's not even a question, it's an examination. If you were to examine your life, are you seeking His presence? Are you seeking the Spirit of God? 
Is your prayer saying, Holy Spirit, fill me? Holy Spirit. And if not, then I want you to pay attention today. Because today, you're going to leave with two things that you know. You can walk out of here and you can know, my heart needs to change. And the only person who can do it is the Spirit of God. Okay? So let's dive into Scripture. 2 Corinthians says this, and Paul's writing, and he writes to the Corinthians, and he says this. He starts off, he says, you, you Corinthians, are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Stop. This little sentence has so much depth in it. Paul is saying people don't see the story of Jesus because you read your Bible. And people don't see the story of Jesus because you wear a cross around your neck. And people don't see Jesus because you have a Christian bumper sticker or the bumper sticker of your church on your car. The epistle of Christ is written, and we can all see it, on your heart. The Spirit of God has written something on your heart, and it's being read by all men. You want to teach your children about Jesus? You want to show Jesus? Don't just don't, don't read them the Bible. Allow the Holy Spirit to change your heart. I'm not, I'm, I love, you're going to find here in a minute, I love reading the Bible. I think reading your Bible to your children is great. But how awful would it be to read your kid the Bible because we're supposed to? And I want you to know it. And yet God hasn't done something with your old hard heart yet. Yes, you're a Christian. Yes, you're going to heaven. But your kids can see through the fake. Your friends can see through the fake. Heck, you can see through the fake. And the answer is we will only become the people God's called us to be when the Holy Spirit finally changes our heart. Clearly, clearly you are an epistle of Christ ministered by, by us. We minister to you, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God. That is so good. Not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of flesh that is of the heart. And Paul is specifically addressing the Moses story. When Moses came off the mountain, carrying the Ten Commandments, but as he came down, he saw that even though the children of Israel had been delivered from slavery, they were still building golden calves. And he threw the tablets on the ground. He was mad. Moses had to go back up, bring down another set of tablets. Moses then being in the presence of God comes off and he was glowing. The word they use, Shekinah glory. It was the presence of God was all over him. And this time when he came off, they noticed that he was carrying new tablets, but it wasn't what they paid attention to. It was the fact that he had been in the presence of God. And his shining, his glowing, the presence was still on him. Yeah, he had a bunch of list of rules they had to follow. But Paul points out, he says, it's not the ink from the Bible you read, and it's not the stone from the tablets that Moses brought down. It's from your heart. And your heart is what sets the stage for all the kingdom things that God wants to do. Yeah. Paul writes on, and he says, behold, excuse me, this is Jeremiah. Okay, this is Jeremiah. Jeremiah is so cool. So now we're going to go back to Old Testament. So this isn't a New Testament thing. Let's look at from Moses what did Jeremiah have to say about this? So cool. He says, behold, hey guys, pay attention. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. It's one thing to have the laws. You're trying to keep the laws. We don't need more laws. Laws don't soften your heart. Laws, don't, laws are great barriers. If you know you stepped outside, these are always pointing back to Jesus. But when we're following Jesus, hey, listen, these are, we can't go off the covenant that Moses had, okay? But we were led them, when they led them out of, of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, 
Though I was a husband to them, saith the Lord. And he continues and says this. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their minds. How's that going to work? And write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they will be my people. You see this? There will be a day. When you don't have to carry the law to know the law. There will be a day to where someone won't have to write it out for you. It will already be on your heart. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying, know the Lord. There will be no need for you to turn to people and tell them, you need to know the Lord. They'll see the Lord in you. For they all shall know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin, and I will remember them no more. I'll remember this sin no more. There will be a day. There will be a day when ink or stone does not show that you are a Jesus follower. But it's your heart. And the way that your heart is directing your life. Ezekiel makes it plainly clear. He says this, I will give you a new heart. And this is God. And, and put a new spirit within you. I will take this heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Now this is him saying, I will give you a new God-given heart, and we will replace that heart of stone that is so corruptible in your life. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them, all because my spirit has changed your heart. You won't have to memorize the laws anymore. You won't have to do the things that you think make you a Jesus follower. Being a Jesus follower will just happen because the Spirit of God will change your heart. And we talk to every young person in the room. Everybody, but you're still living with mom and dad. I'm talking to you on this. And if there is a time in my life that I was probably the angriest the most, it was in my teenage years. I blamed everybody. Mom, <laughs> the baby laughed when I said that. I, I, I blamed mom for stuff. I blamed dad for stuff. I blamed teachers and I blamed coaches. And I thought everybody was stupid. You ever have days like that? And teenagers, can I turn to you and tell you that it'd be easy for us to think that I'm talking to mom and dad here, but I'm specifically talking to you right now, that the only way we are ever going to have the peace and the knowledge of the hand of God on our life, to know the plans of God for your life, is if you let God touch your heart. And even though you're young, it doesn't mean you're not vulnerable. Because in those years in your life, Hard-heartedness in the teenage years are the things that can cause us to hate the people that God's actually put in our life for a reason. You can get catty and mad. You can break off into cliques. And if there ever is a clique and you're not in it, you blame people, don't you? And the reality is, is Holy Spirit wants to show you that your heart is wounded and your heart is broken and your heart is insecure and your heart instantly goes to hate and even though if you know Jesus you still got a heart problem and the spirit of God needs to be invited into your life to soften your heart for life you know why they're clapping because they've all been there before okay you can't think that church is for your mom and dad. You can't think that the Bible is for your mom and dad. I want to give you the opportunity to ask the Holy Spirit, to ask Holy Spirit 
to change my heart so that scripture comes alive for you, so that prayer comes alive for you, so that love for people comes to life for you, even to the point we're going to read in a minute, to the point that they may persecute you, but you're not abandoned. You're, you're, you're set back, but you're not destroyed. And there's a confidence that rides up because you realize people are hurting too. And you know how that feels. And you have a chance to allow Holy Spirit to soften your heart. So, what does it mean to be a Christian? And how can we please God? This is an important question I want you to ask. How do you please God? How do you please God? And and, and even though we live in southeastern New Mexico, there's a little bit of Bible belt in this little county in West Texas that we live in. And, and the unfortunate thing is, over the years, we've taken some really good things, but we've made them the things that we think is going to make us closer to God. Let me, let me show you. How do we please God? By praying the prayer. Maybe that's the salvation prayer. I prayed the prayer. We, we pray the prayer. And then we, and then we go to church. And we go to church because I know that God makes God happy. We pray the prayer, then we go to church, and church is a good place. And I go to church, and I pray the prayer, and I go to church, and I, and I, I'm, I become active. I volunteer because I know that, that pleasing God is, is the thing that we do. So we pray the prayer, we go to church, we become active. And the next thing you know, we're running the camera, or we're serving in kids' church, or, or we're active in the youth group, or we're going to church. And we pray the prayer, we go to church, we be active. And then, and then we, learn, we learn what not to avoid or what to avoid. This is what church is all about, right? This is what we do with our friends. Don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. Avoid this, avoid this. And this is the four things that we do as Bible Belt Christians to please God. And then guess what we do? After we pray the prayer, we go to church, we become active, we learn what to avoid, we're still going to screw up, so we have to repeat. And we pray the prayer, we go to church, we be active, we, we become active, we, we, we learn what to avoid, okay? And then we re- screw up again and we repeat it. And this There's nothing wrong with this list. There's absolutely nothing wrong with this list. Except if your heart is still hard. And these things do massage our heart. But can you imagine if this is what it means to please God after a year of knowing him? After two years. Heaven forbid 10 years. And the only thing we know is to pray our prayers, go to church, be active, and learn what to avoid. And we screw up again. So we repeat. And this becomes an exhausting cycle to where at some point you meet with me or you don't meet with me, but your excuse is always, and it's not really excuse, it's the statement of, I'm sick of this. This Jesus thing, I mean, honestly, I believe Jesus died. I believe he rose again. I believe he is the son of God. I want to go to heaven, but I, man, I don't get it. And I want to be honest with you today because I want to turn to you and tell you that each and every one of these things is great, except if Holy Spirit hasn't dealt with your heart, if Holy Spirit hasn't changed your heart, prayer will never be what it should be. And going to church, I'm a huge church fan, but church will never be what it's supposed to be if you still have an old heart. Becoming active, even volunteering in some amazing places you will forget. And you get a phone call on Saturday night saying, hey, you've been check- you haven't checked in in Planning Center. And the first thing that happens isn't, oh my gosh, I forgot. Yes, I, I look forward to it every week. I love it. That's my ministry. I love it. You will actually go, crap. I was planning on watching Netflix tomorrow. I'm going to call Sal. And nobody's laughing anymore. They're scared too. 
And, 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 and now you're mad, and you're mad because the church only calls you when they need something. Ooh. And you're only mad because nobody else will show up, and they always call me, and I should have never volunteered. Do you realize now you're mad at people, and it's not, people aren't the issue. It's your heart. And we learn things to avoid, and it makes us mad. And we repeat this, and it has nothing to do with these things. It's your heart. And if there was one central thing I want you to get today, and it's something I'd want you to pray, something I want you to say, I want you to say this. I need a new heart. I need a new heart towards the way I view life. I need a new heart on how I view people. I need a new heart on what it means to be a Jesus follower. I got that I'm lost and now I'm found, but now I need a new heart so that I can follow the Jesus that rescued me. And how do I know this? Because I've been there. And can I really be honest with you? I've still not been delivered of my heart. It is a daily conversation with Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, I need you today. Holy Spirit, I need you today. Holy Spirit, come fill me. Holy Spirit, change my heart. And it changes how I see people, and it changes how I see circumstances, and it changes everything. Christianity. Christianity, if we were to give it a definition, just for today, we could go a million different directions, but just for today, it's not my work for God. And maybe you thought it was. Maybe you thought being a Jesus follower, maybe on this whole series we've been on about assignment, your assignment, this is what you do for God. You do this for God. No. Can you remember the one thing I told you of where, where do we receive our assignment? It's in our secret place. It's being in Holy Spirit. It's being alone. And it's not my work for God. It's God's work in me. When Holy Spirit comes and I invite him, everything that is laws and, and, and stuff and all, all things meant for good, but they don't produce life instantly happen because Holy Spirit infuses it into this old hard heart instantly. And what ends up happening is God and his kingdom ends up coming out of me. I've had to learn this over the years. Because I was all about doing what God wanted me to do. Do, 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 do. But the best days of my life where the best life took place wasn't me doing it was me being in the presence of God. Simply asking Holy Spirit, come fill me. Change my heart. And it was like my taste buds changed. It was like my taste buds completely changed. Second Corinthians goes on. And he says this. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 15. But even to this day, when Moses is read, when Old Testament law is read... It's like a veil lies on their hearts. When you start reading the laws and saying, don't do this, don't do this, it's like a veil covers our hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. Did you hear that? Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. There is freedom. Okay, so I'm going to say something real quick, okay? I don't know how you're going to respond to this, but I want you to hear this. Freedom. Liberty. So you're saying that where the Spirit of the Lord is, I can do anything I want to do? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, I can do anything I want to do? Absolutely. But you didn't see that one coming. Let me be very clear. Maybe you were brought up in a home where all you knew was rules and laws. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. Well, what kind of God who gives us permission to have faith and to choose 
would then step in and tell us, you can't do that. And I bet you've been taught that your whole life. But the reality is, when you have the Spirit of God living in you, you have the permission to do anything you want to do, but you just don't. Not because you're forced, but because my heart's changed. I can tell you right now, as a pastor of Cowboy Junction Church, I'm not bound by the law. I can do anything I want to do. But if you ever see me do the right thing, it wasn't a rule that caused me to do the right thing. It was me having the Spirit of God inside of me to do the thing that I knew I needed to do. If you've ever known me growing up, I was a little liar. Lying can get you a long ways in life. Don't let anybody fool you. I cheated my way through high school. I I don't know how you feel about that. But the proof is lying works. And and every sense Holy Spirit has showed me that my heart is rotten. As a Christian, I was lying for all the right reasons. And Holy Spirit showed me that my heart was rotten. And it wasn't going to be a rule that changed my heart. My mama could come and tell me all day long, Ty Bean, don't you dare lie. I could get called in the principal office and get bustings because I lied. I could get my scholarships and and my diplomas taken away from me because I lied. And it probably wouldn't change anything about me being the liar that I was. So, what do you do? Do I have full freedom to lie at 50 years old? Sure I do. But I don't. But it wasn't a rule that changed my heart. It was the Spirit of God that changed my heart. And if you're in this room and you cringed a little bit because I said, I can do anything I want to do. I could. You could. We could. But the only thing that's going to change our heart and move us to God's plan for our life is the Spirit of God changing our hearts. Could you have an abortion? Absolutely. But the Spirit of the living God is speaking to you and saying, come on. You're scared. You're terrified. Your future looks impossible. Let me change your heart and show you what I could do. Just simply invite me. Holy Spirit, come show me change my heart and I will show you right exactly what I want you to do with this pregnancy everyone that's concerned about me not preaching on woke be anti-woke Ty preach on woke preach on preach on men walking into children women's bathrooms women walking on men's bathrooms now you never hear complaints about that do you I don't need to preach on woke I, I have some firm stances on the direction that I know is God's right and God's wrong. But mo- it won't be my rules that change things. It'll be when men humble themselves and realize they need a Savior. And then when we see we need a Savior, we're still going to have the old things on us. But can I turn and tell you that the freedom we have in Christ is surrendering to the Holy Spirit that changes our heart. I can never talk you out of your sexuality. I can never talk you out of your sin. I can never talk you out of your viewpoints and liberal viewpoints, but I can turn to you and introduce you to Jesus. And that's why that you can be all kinds of things and come to Christ. But it's when we're in Christ that we're going to see that there is a battle going on between good and evil, right and wrong, darkness and light. And laws don't change you. Holy Spirit can change your heart. And when you stand before the church one day giving a testimony, the wrong way to do it would be to, Pastor Ty's teaching changed my life. Ty didn't do nothing. 
The church was the best thing that ever happened to me. Church got me out of my anemia and gave me this gut here today. And, and that, that's not how you do it. What changed you? And you'll stand before people and say, I needed a Savior. But after the Savior, my heart was still bad. And Holy Spirit changed my heart. But you may say, Ty, if you gave me freedom, I wouldn't do God things. I don't, I don't do God things. I, I don't ever choose God's plan. Well, let's talk about that real quick. The question I have for you is, do you really want his glory? Do you really want his presence? And I think your heart does, your spirit does. Just the way you are right now. And if you really want his glory, I'll tell you this. You will want the God things if we have the spirit of God living in us. Went to Washington, D.C. and saw the reflection pool. And, and, and one of the things about the reflection pool is it reflects these important monuments that as Americans we're supposed to take a look at. And then as Americans we are supposed to look into the re reflection pool and see the reflection we see back with these memorials in the background. And it's supposed to examine our heart. And in reflection, one of the things I want you to get is that's what we're asking you to do. In today's message, do you reflect Jesus? And that's the job of the Holy Spirit. When we allow him to change our heart it will reflect what's in us. Another way of saying is this. We become what we behold. Yeah. Let's talk about your assignment. You're worried about going to work and being a witness. You're worried about the people that God is saying, I've called you there. You're trying to work it. And can I just turn to you and say, let him change it. Because when your heart's changed, when Holy Spirit changes your heart, you reflect what you behold. You won't have to tell people the change. They see the change. Remember, this, this message only has two points. Our hearts are rotten, and Holy Spirit can change it. Our hearts are bad, and Holy Spirit can change it. 2 Corinthians, Paul wraps up by saying this. These people whose minds the God, lowercase g, these people whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. If you struggle, if the God of this age has manipulated you and given you that hard heart. It's the gospel, the glory of Christ, the image of God that can only change them. And he goes on and says this, for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown on our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We, we are hard pressed. Okay, remember I brought this up a minute ago? We're gonna go through hard times on every side, yet we're not crushed. You know why? Because when Holy Spirit changes our hearts, Yes, we're going to go through persecution, tough times, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in this world. Yeah, kiddo, like you're going to go to school, and they're going to put you in different cliques, and they're going to leave you out of some, but it's not going to affect you like it used to. It used to consume you, you went depression. You cried. You wanted your mom to fix it. She couldn't fix it. You wanted her to get counseling for you, but she couldn't afford counseling. So now you're mad at everybody. Can I turn to you and tell you your heart's wicked? And Holy Spirit wants to give you a new heart so that no matter how hard it gets, you're a new creation. 
in Christ Jesus. And you actually don't hate people. You love them because you realize they're hurting too. We're perplexed. We're confused. But we're not in despair because I got a new heart. I'm persecuted but not forsaken. I'm struck down but I'm not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body of dying in the Lord Jesus that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. So the light of Christ automatically comes out. So I got three questions to wrap this up. There's three questions that I want you to Can you just take a minute and just ask yourself this question? Do I really want God's glory? Do I really want God's presence? I want to see life differently. I want to see life through God's eyes. I want to see the glory of God. great question because until you want to see it until your heart hungers for the things of God like your like your stomach hungers for food second do you really want his spirit to ask Holy Spirit I can't do this Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, flood my life. Holy Spirit, fill me from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Holy Spirit, change this heart of mine. Holy Spirit, I'm trying to do these works, but Holy Spirit, I want to be in your work. Not working. Holy Spirit, fill my life. The third thing, Do I need a new heart? That's that's a great question. Do you need a new heart? Because the old heart, the old heart will never produce the righteousness of God. Stay right there. Let, Let the band just play for a minute. Just take a minute. What if we just right now just begin to ask Holy Spirit, I need a new heart. Holy Spirit, will you fill me? Holy Spirit, I need you. Holy Spirit, change this heart of mine. Father God, today I pray for each and every one that's in this room and watching online. And I pray that you, Holy Spirit, would do what only you can do. 